Okay, now it's time for part four. Gentalk making a living, subsistence strategies, part four, agrarians and feudalists. What are agrarians? Agrarians are people who practice agriculture. So how do they make a living? They engage in extensive crop cultivation. It's crop specialization so that they can trade and sell what they grow. So unlike horticulturalists, agrarians or those who engage in agriculture grow far more than what they need. And they typically specialize in one or two, maybe three different kinds of crops. And they grow in excessive excess so that they can sell it for money today, but also they can trade for more goods, more land, more resources. Populations that can be supported through agrarianism include population sizes in the thousands to hundreds of thousands. So if you think back to our hunting and gatherers where there were 25 to 50, horticulturalists, which were in the hundreds, Pastoralists could also sit around 150 or so, maybe 200, more likely closer to 100 and 150. And now our agrarians, because they can grow such an enormous surplus of food, grain, tomatoes, coffee, tobacco, um, corn, wheat, rice, they're the community consumes only a portion of it, the family that owns the land, an even smaller portion of it, and the rest is used as surplus. Another word for surplus is wealth or capital. That's where we get the concept of capital is through this agrarian type of society. And as agrarians evolved, we shifted to the tra to, from trade and barter to actually using symbols that equaled an amount of corn or an amount of crops, and we call that cash or money. In terms of life chances or access to um, important resources in life among agrarians, those who own crops, of course, have ready access to necessities, food, and also the ability to sell what they've grown so that they can purchase or obtain anything else that they need and then some. Others sell their labor to have access to food that's produced through the farming and hopefully to have access to some shelter and other basic necessities. They're moving away as agrarians from the tropics to subtropical and, and also temperate climates like California, the Mediterranean. So agrarians still live in parts of the world in which for most of the year they can grow crops However, they have advanced tools, and we'll talk about that in the next um, subsection here, so that they can grow a little bit further into a fall or autumn season and start a little bit earlier into a spring. And in some cases, they've found their way to work well into winter. Tools and technology for agrarians. They use complex tools to maintain crops in one location and cultivate crops, package them, and distribute them. So agrarians are really our most advanced in terms of technology, and we saw a huge advancement with agrarian societies. Agrarians figured out that rather than using a human being to dig holes deeper to plant seeds so that they could grow crops, they used the brute force of yaks, oxen, and horses, and that's where we get the concept of horsepower, to pull plows behind them so that they no longer needed the slash and burn technique because these animals could do, there's where you get that beast of burden concept, they could do the work that a human being could not do, just didn't have the strength to do, so that they could continuously cultivate and um, till the same land over and over again. And they learned from the pastoralists to engage in really substantive um, excuse me, um, breeding of animals or animal husbandry so that they could have as many horses, oxen, as well as sheep, goats, other things that they needed in order to grow all of these crops, to carry these crops, to carry wood that they would, um, that they would chop down to build more secure structures, to carry mud and clay so that they could make concrete walls and bricks, and to carry the wood that they would use to create paper. All of these things allowed them to create things like candles that they could mass produce and use within their larger dwellings to create packaging out of paper from the bark of wood 
and then also because these animals were strong and could walk and run and move for long periods of time they were also able to then distribute them because they could carry them on wagons and they could also have the strength to move um long distances certainly longer than human beings on feet while they carried the pr the products that humans were creating through their agricultural um through their agricultural means advanced fertilization tech fertilization techniques and transportation developed during this agrarian time period and again it really was rooted in the use of large strong domesticated animals like horses yak oxen etc also the um, out of this time period emerged new technologies to grow crops to transport crops etc were developed requiring some people to earn higher levels of education to manage and use these technologies so the early techies were building things like the early automobiles early wagons that were more effective and eventually built automobiles as we ushered into the next age which will be the industrial era in terms of division of labor this is when we start to see a really significant division of labor women care for families as they ha as they have with all of the other types of um, societies and they refine goods produced for sale like candles cloth fabrics baskets pottery etc men control farming production and distribution some own the means of production and some people trade their labor to access what is produced so for the first time in the history of human beings some have control of this production through the agricultural farms and others have to sell their labor in order to earn access to those resources so now we've got some territorialism and some land that people definitely want to hold on to and we'll get to that in a couple of minutes because it's producing wealth and allowing them to live very comfortable lives in terms of quality of life and this concept of surplus crops are grown well beyond the means of a community's needs a surplus of resources exists for some those who own the means of production have more possessions and escape hunger and hardship among agrarians that was not the case with hunters and gatherers horticulturalists or pastoralists they all could succumb to hunger and hardship whereas with agrarians and their advanced technology they're able to build castles and very sturdy and strong dwellings grow enough crops to have enough food to eat and build enough of a surplus or wealth or capital to save and save for themselves and save for their families and their close communities stratification among classes emerges as the haves and have nots develop social classes become a reality among agrarians before the agrarian times we did not have social classes everyone was a member of the same community men and women own property or excuse me men own property and resources and women care for the home and the family but they don't own property in most agrarian societies unless they're linked to their husbands and in many societies when the husbands die the women no longer own the property so if they don't have a son who's an heir or a brother they could lose all of those resources so they're typically married off very quickly oftentimes to a brother of the husband that they may have lost or another family member um, men enjoy more power and are judged based, based on their ability to earn a living and a woman's worth is linked to her success in the home so a lot of the traditional gender roles that we see today stem from these agrarian cultures in which men because they'd always done the hunting first that was sort of the public political life that didn't produce the most in terms of calories now move forward a, a few hundred years that same space now becomes the space where there is power and men own the means of production they own the land they want to make sure they know who their children are so they know who they're passing their their um, wealth onto and so they need to know who they're married to marriage becomes a legal um binding social practicality as well we start to now have land surveyors who figure out where to draw lines and where ownership of land begins and ends before agrarian societies there was no such thing as land ownership and no such thing as formal or legalized marriage 
Men enjoy more power and are judged based on their ability, as I mentioned, to earn a living, and women based on their success in the home. So in terms of territories and land, to grow specialized crops, people need to own land. They need to own a lot of land. Legal land ownership emerges. This causes bands and tribes to develop into nation states. So some of those horticultural groups and even some of those pastoral groups develop as they figure out how to capitalize on both the pastoral animal, animal husbandry and the growing of crops of the hunters and gatherers, bring them together and some become agrarians. Um, they develop nation states and oversee legal processes like land surveying and ownership. Military defenses, of course, to protect all of this food in surplus that they're growing that they can't even see from outside their front door. And, of course, the legalization of marriage so that they know who they're responsible for, where inheritance goes to, and also then where the cheap labor is because it's not within your family. But if you want to keep growing more and more crops, you need to be able to have people work your land for a lot less than what it costs you to grow and grow and grow. So cash crops create a cash currency that is the development of money. And it's really just a symbol to represent how much something is worth. And it becomes a currency exchange between beyond the barter system. And so now among agrarians, you can exchange coins or other, it could become paper money. It can become other wooden coins in some cases that symbolized that you had a certain amount of crops or the value in gold, as many of them would trade their crops for gold. They would then put their gold in the bank and the bank would give them coins, wooden coins, metal coins, or paper notes for the value of the amount of gold, of gold that they were storing within their bank. In terms of relationships, the division of labor between the sexes is very clear, creating inequality among men and women probably among the most severe cases of inequality among men and women, much like what we saw with pastoralists. Marriage becomes a legal contract overseen by the state to determine inheritance and lineage. Social inequality from poor and homeless to wealthy creates conflict among classes of people. So now we have many people living at different levels of, um, of, means to produce for themselves. Prior to agrarians with pastoralists and horticulturalists, you didn't have people who were homeless. Within the same community, no one had a nicer hut or um, a better place really to live. You took care of your family, you took care of your community, community and it was considered um, negative if anyone in your community wasn't able to live at the same quality or level as everyone else. They got the same amount of food, wore the same kinds of clothes, lived in the same kinds of shelters. Agrarian society changed all of that with that, with that excess of wealth and power. So feudalism um, really derived out of this agricultural area. Feudalism is grounded in successful agricultural endeavors. So feudalism is a more advanced, for lack of a better term, but a more advanced type of agrarianism. In feudal societies, noble families emerge and they grant land to just select farmers. Nobles belong to a hereditary class with high social or political status. But there's no rationale for how the first nobles became noble. There's no genetic um, explanation for why it is. It's just those who are the most successful hunters and gatherers who became horticulturalists and pastoralists, who grew the most crops, who controlled those means, became the nobles. And it was that simple. That's where their lineage started. It could have been anyone. It's just those who ended up in those positions, became nobles hundreds and thousands of years after we started planting our own crops and engaging in animal husbandry or breeding of animals. A class of farm workers called peasants work the land but do not own land. So we have peasants at the lower, lower class in feudalism, which again is a part of agrarian culture. And then you have middle classes most of whom live on land either in exchange for work or they're granted land ownership from the nobles. So it's sort of two classes in the middle. And then there are the noble classes. So really four classes in most feudalist societies. The noble people, the kings, the queens, the dukes, the duchesses, etc. 
those who they grant land to to own and they engage in labor and political activities for them and on behalf of the nobles. Then there are those who are allowed to live on their land as long as they produce the crops and other resources that are needed for that noble kingdom. And then the peasants who move from place to place who don't usually have a long-term consistent place to live or to call home who sell their labor in order to get by. In return for farming, the needs of the region overseen by feudal lords, farmers are allowed to keep their land and they agree to fight for the noble lords. So those first, those top three classes, you've got the nobles, then you've got the two middle classes that agree if there's a war, they and their sons will fight in that war. And even peasants who are working for them, who are being cared for them, agree to fight in their war. However, peasants might move from one side to another, depending upon where they're being provided for and which farmers they're working for. Land is passed down through family ties and a caste system emerges. A person is born into their status with little or little to no char change um, little to no chance is what that should say of moving up or down in the caste system. So the difference between a caste system and a class system is castes are really cast in stone. Whatever group you're born into, a noble, an upper middle class, a noble middle class, or a peasant, in agrarian cultures where feudalism thrives, that's where you're going to stay. Occasionally, you could marry into a class higher than yours, and it is also possible that you could impress, oftentimes through warfare, a noble, and they may move you up into a land ownership position. But many of you have probably read and watched documentaries and movies about nobles. They oftentimes married within the same lineage, their own brothers, sisters, and cousins, just to keep that ownership of land to only a few people. There are obviously problems with that, but the idea was not to spread that wealth beyond those noble castes. Life chances, therefore, are predestined at birth. The likelihood that they will have access to resources, land, crops, etc., were pretty much determined at the point in which people were born. As feudal territories grew, with more land to harvest and more people to support, these so-called advanced agrarians developed armies, nation states, and war for, warfare tactics to protect their land and their citizenry. Powerful noble classes developed enough power to conquer, as we call it, throughout the globe, really to steal land, crops, and resources all throughout the globe. So it's sort of this perpetuating force in which when you have the ability to grow more and more and build your wealth and build your power, you want more and to build your wealth and build your power. So we see a lot of Western European cultures who engaged in this conquering, stealing, and taking over of cultures throughout the world. The English, the French, the Dutch, the Portuguese, the Italian, even um, even Scandinavian countries, Denmark, Sweden with their Viking era, all engaged in sort of these conquering and stealing of other lands to get their resources to grow. Oftentimes in reaction to if they weren't the ones growing, someone was going to come and steal and take theirs. So warfare is a very common practice among agrarian feudalist societies. Among feudalists, there's a desire for more land to cultivate, to own, and to control, which generated more wealth and power just for the owners and those who they deemed appropriate, those higher middle classes. We would have never experienced the genocide, though, of First Nations people, who we often refer to as American Indians or Native Americans, or slavery in the Americas, apartheid in South Africa, and the list goes on. If it wasn't for what we were able to learn, develop, and do with agrarianism and feudalism. So with everything that's developed and all of our advanced technology and advanced capabilities, there certainly is a double-edged sword and social inequality thrives as each of these levels grow and certainly at this level of agrarianism and feudalism.